sometimes, if you want to find out what's really happening, you've got to get out there and look. I'm Emma Inch. I'm an award-winning drinks writer and former British Beer Writer of the Year. Back in March 2020, the world changed for everyone, and when the pandemic struck, the drinks industry was one of the sector's worst affected. After spending a few weeks following the unfolding crisis from the safety of my home, I decided I wanted to see for myself how drinks producers were managing at this incredibly difficult time. So I packed up my other home, my motorhome, and I hit the road. And what I found are stories of resilience, creativity, innovation, and ultimately, survival. Come and join me on my journey. There are a number of breweries that will forever characterise lockdown, and for me, Ansbach and Hobday is one. Founded in Bermondsey back in 2013 by two childhood friends, Ansbach and Hobday opened a new production site and tap room in Croydon back in the spring. Not the best time to take on a new venture, you might think, but as you'll hear from founders Paul Anspach and Jack Hobday, some things, particularly the acquisition of a canning line, have worked in their favour. It certainly meant that the motorhome fridge has never been short of an Anspach and Hobday can or two. I arrived at the Croydon Brewery just moments after it was announced that London was moving on to Tier 2 restrictions. The subsequent interview captures a moment in time, a brewery working hard to thrive, hard to survive in these unusual times. Okay, cool. Uh, I'm Paul Anspach, uh, co-founder uh, of Anspach and Hobday Brewery. I'm Jack Hobday, the other co-founder of Anspach and Hobday Brewery. So tell me how things are going. What's going on? How, th- how are you doing here? Uh, reasonably okay, I think, in the times, given the circumstances. It's hard, um, I think, it's, it's become... It's got to the point where it's quite mentally challenging right now. We've just uh, heard that we're going to Tier 2, and no doubt by the time this is out there, we'll be at Tier 3. Um, and while well, it's been six months of it, it's been really difficult on everyone, and I think we've coped quite well. Um, so I don't think it's all doom and gloom, but it's, it's very mm. trying, even if, even if we feel we've come through it so far quite well. Yeah, the initial uh, news back in March was... It was pretty shocking and uh, I think there was certainly a week of real, uh, not panic, but I guess dread <laughs> about what was going to happen. But um, very quickly we, we were able to sort of rally around and, and, and a few things in, in the timing of our sort of um, setup and expansion here, namely the, the um, commissioning of our canning line. Uh, gave us the opportunity to really be able to adjust to the situation and um and it became it became clear fairly quickly that we were still going to have enough business to sustain us um without fortunately without having to to let anyone go um we obviously shut the retail for um for the time that we 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 were required to but then even when we got that that open again uh, it was a similar story just kind of adapting and and making the sites that were once you know very on trade focused just completely off trade focused and um the team here everyone worked incredibly hard and um got behind the strategies that me and jack were you know being in place the web store was was invaluable and i think we couldn't thank our customers enough really for um for the support they showed us Mm. as a local business and, and even across the country um you know, there was a, in February we had hardly any sort of web sales. It wasn't. It was something we just about set up at the end of November last year, and it ticked along. We then had the cans, and um, well we have our we have our shareholders. We crowdfunded two years ago, and um, we reached out to them and said, "Look, now's the time if you want to buy some beer." <laughs> and suddenly there was this flood of sales, and the canning line had just been commissioned. And of course, cans are much better for selling um, uh, and sending in, in, in the post. So. Um, since then it's been a, a staple of the of the yeah. business and and certainly something which has kept us going i think if we hadn't had it this whole story would have been entirely different um maybe, maybe, we, maybe the, the whole place would be a lot emptier but we'd, um, be, we'd be retraining we, as <laughs> yeah. a ballerina or something <laughs> no obviously not a ballerina but, um, which you know i think i think the way that we rallied around that and our customers came together and 
the cans themselves I think you know the beers are at their best and the attention that that was getting really held us together and kept us going as a team yeah. so it, it's in many ways it's made us stronger but we're obviously only halfway through it and uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm tired of it so you know we'll carry on and um, as I say we really appreciate that support yeah I mean, you're saying about the sort of cans came at the right time. That absolutely did, didn't it? That was an absolute... Yeah. One would say a stroke of genius had it been planned, but an absolute <sighs> stroke of luck, wasn't it? It was... Um, we kind of sort of half-joked about, you know, if we were going to launch... If we were going to launch canned beer that was available through, you know, off-trade and retail on our web store, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't it be an ideal situation if that was suddenly the only way you could buy alcohol? Um, so it really, <laughs> it really did, it really did enable us to get to put all of our kind of resources behind the cans in terms of production and marketing and, and stuff like that. But um, yeah, also really, yeah, really give the push and, and draw all the attention to them. Um, and actually, the kind of social media side of that as well was interesting because um, cans, you know, cans kind of dominate the the online space no one's you don't really see people like or too much you know taking pictures of tap badges and stuff it, it doesn't happen as much as can so um kind of all these stars aligned and we were able to send them out to to various people as well and so all of a sudden we've, we're getting this attention that we've never had because we've been bottling for the last you know six years and and that you know that as is the case across the board has kind of really kind of dried up you know no one was interested in bottles anymore so it was kind it was it was the one kind of bit of real luck in terms of timing that at a time when everything else around you is kind of looking really, really uncertain to kind of have that and have the, have the cannon line ready. And thankfully, it's a really easy bit of kit to use as well. So I think we did a shout out uh, halfway through to the guys that built it because uh, I think maybe when we hit the like 100,000 can mark, you know, only a few months in or something, it's like it's kind of testament to what a what a straightforward, easy to use bit of kit the guys had, had built. Um, just enabled us micro, micro can, can yeah. yeah really enabled us to just kind of go from zero experience to to kind of run it at, at its kind of max capacity um, so it's a, a big learning curve but absolutely kind of saved the day and you, and you've uh, you know your um you've, your artwork's always been very strong but the cans have enabled you to really go to town with that haven't they tell me about that a bit yeah i mean we we kind of seen the the trend in in craft beer i think uh for for a long time has been bringing up the artwork on cans and it sort of happened that I don't know if anyone remembers our bottles but we used to still have the same two characters on there they were just smaller and sort of set nicely against each other almost like figurines um, and there was a time when we thought we were quite like forward thinking having artwork on our cans mm. uh, sorry bottles back then um, so when we came to look at the cans we thought about how we could evolve the brand and bringing up the artwork was the obvious thing to do and I think it's worked really well I mean they're, they're fantastic illustrations I'm trying to bring it closer so people can see but um, you know suddenly people are calling the pale the cricket beer which before yeah. you know <laughs> the pale. which was always the dream for um, it and you know we've then been able to enjoy some really different things like our golden bitter that's our first gold label mm. um, and I think I think we've still retained a little bit of class in there mm. so that it's not just sort of garish and too showy even for a golden shiny yeah that's almost like bling that. to date um, it, it was great because a lot of the illustrations on the core range you know we have we have been using for the last you know six six years or so but just by having the the bigger space on the on the label to work with and pu pulling the illustrations up making them the focus you know we're, we're picking out new bits of detail that we hadn't really seen before um the illustrator's a guy called alan batley um, and he's he's just so good to work with you know we'll send him like a few a bit of a mood board a few pictures or whatever and within you know a couple of days if not sooner he'll be straight back with sketches and it's like it just captures exactly what we were kind of after um, this new one's uh, a real favorite of mine you've got two of our employees on there you've got Dan one of our brewers who's it's a table beer so it's it's not necessarily always the case that the characters are linked to uh, the beer although I think there's a slight link here in that we all think table beers are quite new but they've actually been around for hundreds and hundreds of years 
So you've got your old uh, jester, and then you've got um, Ed Clivens, who looks after our sales. He's our, our modern comedian. And uh, as I say, you know, making them larger just brings it to life. And, and you know, hopefully it's something nice to behold, and it puts a smile on. Yeah, yeah. His face. Yeah, and actually having to put everything in can um, meant that we kind of had to readdress you know how we were doing our specials because we we have the character sets for the core beers but um we weren't really sure which how we were going to take the 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 specials um we ended up we had like four four double tanks worth of beer that was all due to be kegged or cast for various things and then all of a sudden we just had to can it all so on the fly we had to come up with some a lot of new labels actually and yeah again so that's an example so the idea with that is we're going to just take little elements of, of the beer. So this is a double IPA, so it's obviously all about the hops. And then we're essentially building up this catalogue of small illustrations that we can kind of drop in and out of, of different beers. I think we did an English pale with a nice little oast house on it, um, loads of different things. So we're building up this really nice collection now of, uh, of just little like motifs and illustrations that we'll be, we'll be hopefully using across some more of our kind of output as well, like merchandise and stuff like that. They're so, the illustrations are just so good, so we want to kind of make the most of them. Um, yeah, and they brought they brought the attention back to the beer, which, as I say, I think is tasting better than ever. It was always very good, though. But uh, it's amazing what uh, a strong and attractive brand, even when we weren't in a bad sp- space, but just taking it up a notch. Yeah, has really um, sort of showcased everything, and, and uh, I yeah. mean, feedback really it's been overwhelming this year in terms of, of mm. uh, how much people have enjoyed them yeah and I suppose one of the things that's uh, that's really um, that really strikes me and that I really like about about your beer and that I because it's one of the things that I love about beer itself is this ability that you seem to have of bring of combining the traditional and mm. the and the innovative your artwork does that you know very clearly but but you do that with your recipes and your yeah. style and everything tell me a bit about that I think it was, it, it, it goes back to some of the original beers we made um, when we were homebrewing, like the Porter. You know, it, there, was, there was a reason why that beer worked for us at the time, and there was a reason why it worked for London, and a lot of that is to, is to do with the water. So when we were learning how to brew, it kind of made sense that we would have more success brewing these styles that are kind of from, from uh, the history of the part of the country that we're from. So that kind of set, sowed that little seed of, of history. Um, but then obviously we were learning about all the different new kind of flavours and techniques that were going on as we were learning about beer, you know, probably, you know, eight, nine, ten years ago now. Um, so I think that kind of set us on that path. And um, I think at, at, at the time when, when we started, we were probably seen as one of the more experimental breweries. And that was probably a stronger focus because we were doing a load of different styles. Um, but I think the world then has shifted in that, you know, whilst, we, whilst at that time, you know, doing a Saison was pretty, you know, out there maybe for the market. You know, now to be experimental, you need to be putting, you know, lactose and um, puree and, you know, everything, everything in, in beers, donuts and whatever. Um, and that, for me, anyway, wasn't really, you know, that... that wasn't particularly why I was interested in beer. You know, the stories are around breweries, and, and we've, we've spent a lot of time since visiting breweries, breweries that we kind of really looked up to when we were getting into beer, and breweries with really rich histories, um, like Schenkler, for example. Um, that's the really interesting side of things to me, and you can use techniques that have been around for hundreds of years. You can use ingredients, um, the, the, the main ingredients that we have as brewers, to come up with a whole range of flavours and, and styles of beer and that and it just it didn't seem very innovative to me just to put ice cream in a beer um, that's kind of what from what, how I see it has kind of driven us to now being the focus is more kind of on our tradi- traditional side of brewing um, but still kind of up, brought up to date and contemporary and we, we just we're just a little we just have that we just have that firm footing in kind of the, the past yeah I think it's a little, um, it's a, it's a respect thing in that we obviously, anyone who's brewing is, is, is brewing off the foundations that have been set for hundreds of years, whether that's on the continent or in the UK or across the pond with the uh, innovations the Americans have, have taken. And there's always room for growth there, and mm. that's really exciting. And, and 
that way you can adapt but it doesn't mean you have to turn everything upside down all the time yeah um, and that I think is where the credit for some of the beers we brought out this year has really like been appreciated and allowed to shine whether that's the ordinary bitter or the golden bitter um, you know y- you've got uh, these styles which you know some people I think Adrian Tony Jones came out and said he doesn't he never thought bitter should ever work in a can but yeah but we'd, we'd managed to make it work. Yeah. And, you know, there's a perfect example of old and new coming together. Yeah, absolutely. And to be fair, it's been, it's been a sort of evolution that we've gone through as a brewery ourselves in that I'm um, speak for myself here because I know Jack and I have many discussions about this back in the day. You know, if you asked me when we started out whether, whether we should be brewing ordinary bitter, I probably would have laughed at you and said, Absol-. I probably did, you know, said absolutely not. Um, but you, know, <laughs> you grow and you mature and you, you, you maybe uh, listen a bit more <laughs> I've got nothing to add it makes me wonder why I haven't been growing <laughs> yeah T- uh, tell me about um, about some of the styles. I mean, coming here, you've been able to brew a lager, mm. haven't you? Which is which is fantastic. Yeah, that was that was something that again, you know, we we probably would have never really thought that that was going to be part of of our plan. You know, drinking just all the kind of West Coast stuff that was coming over, um, and at that time, you know, probably coming over in pretty bad condition just kind of bitter and oxidised that's kind of what we what we were striving to yeah. <laughs> but you know lager lager's obviously a beer with a fantastic rich history and tradition and, and done properly it can be just amazing so um, it's that kind of done properly thing has always been that has, has really become our kind of you know the, the, the focus behind these beers so uh, we started brewing at Bermondsey before we had the horizontals um, we knew that we wanted to give the beer the time that it needed so it was never going to be something that we were necessarily always going to have or was going to be the cheapest beer we produced or whatever because it was going to tie up a tank for so long um, and the ingredients we were using were certainly not the cheapest um, so when we put the plan together for here um, we wanted to make sure we could facilitate a growth in, in our lager production and, and horizontals seem like the right way to go you know there's there's reasons why um, you know all the all the the traditional proper lager brewers do it in that way. So um, it was so really it was really exciting to have the opportunity to put them in and, and start using them. Um, the the German the Oktoberfest beers that we brought out this year, um, I think, is kind of us really kind of growing into getting our heads around how to use them properly. Um, and you know, got some really nice beer coming out of them now. Yeah, it's it's probably the the full circle for any craft beer or beer drinker who who may have started their life drinking you know poor imitations of European lager produced by big breweries in the UK and then you know goes through your pale, your IPA, your stouts, your porters, your saisons, and then finally comes back to realizing that you know the best beers in Germany are probably the lagers, mm. and if you can if you can try and brew that and, and come up with something where people can pay you favourably to those then yeah. f- from our side I think that's a real sense of um, achievement to, to get yeah. back around there yeah and again we wanted to make sure that if we were going to put a lager out especially because the way we name our beers we just call them what they are you know, it has to be like a really good example we can't we can't do like a Kolsch and just call it a lager and then a little writing underneath right you know Kolsch style lager or whatever it's got to be proper. Yeah, Kolsch is a great style of beer in its own right, you know. Um, yeah, yeah, call it that. Um, yeah, so, so that's why it's, it's, it's taken us, you know, however many years to get to the point where we think we can do it. Um, and now it's going great. Yeah, 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 yeah. Making me want one, actually. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's some in the tank. Yeah. <laughs> a little sample later. <laughs> And I think that you've, you've mentioned a couple of times that kind of need to do things right and the need to be very clear. That sort of integrity kind of runs throughout. That's, that's very important mm. to you, I guess. I think so. And again, I think it's one of those things that we've grown into a little bit. Um, you know, reflecting on the, the, the beers that kind of we get excited about drinking. Um, 
there's always it's always there's something behind the brewery or whether it's whether it's been around for generations or whether it's just the attitudes of the of the people um, behind it it's that integrity is a, is is a big part of it it's also precision in in just getting really nice clean balanced flavors you know that's that's always been a a debate that Jack and I've had when designing recipes early you know in the early days um, balance has always been that that thing that's that will maybe rein one of us back if we say if I wanted to do like I don't know some of our first IPAs and make them just stupidly bitter you know Jack will come in with well you know it still needs to be balanced and drinkable and all of that and that kind of that tension for want of a better word has, has always been there and I think that's what that's what drives a lot of the beers as well and naturally I think that's what leads you to more traditional styles because they've stuck around for so long for a reason right because they're drinkable well put together clean precise all of these things that's what we really kind of aim for yeah I think that's very fair um, so tell me a little bit about how the brewery came about you've been friends for a long time haven't you yeah we've known each other since kindergarten which yeah it does feel like quite a long time now <laughs> um, we uh, we were both at, at university at the same time in London and ended up being um, flatmates and uh, my lecturer at uni said have a go at home brewing and um, I think Paul and I were both quite creative and, and driven to to uh, sort of master that you know we used to do a lot of music and it it, it was the same sort of um, kick we'd get out of writing songs and things like that that we wanted to make beer that was good and no one cared about our music and everyone loved our beer and uh, we were lucky in our our first porter was well it was suited to the water style which is a big part of brewing and something we were learning um, and we happened to hit upon a very good recipe and uh, a good method and um, carried sort of let our ambition run run ahead of us we hadn't really done any proper work because we were just coming out of uni so it was um, it was you know we didn't have any shame in, in putting the beer in front of people and saying what do you think and we had good feedback early on from uh, people like Oz Clark and uh, Melissa Cole and um, uh, it it sort of ran away from there. We did, I think we were the first UK brewery to use Kickstarter, and we got our first 100 litre kit, which frankly was a, the sort of volume that a, a rich home brewer would use. Yeah. It, it, you know, to say it was the new brewery is, is it over-egging it a little bit, but back then it, it meant that to us, and um, we got our arch in Bermondsey. Um, and then yeah fast forward six years and we're we're here in Croydon with lager tanks and um a 1100 litre kit uh it's been quite a journey yeah <laughs> absolutely and tell me about about Bermondsey where are we there now how is Bermondsey coping at the moment and in terms of the beer mine in terms of the yeah. breweries that are there I think um I think we're quite a good sort of case study there because we've actually now we've moved all of the the, well, the bulk of the production kit out we're still producing um, there that's going to be our sort of mixed fermentation site um, we've got more uh, you know we've got more space to accommodate uh, customers than we ever have but even even with, we've just done a, a nice refurb there I mean the place looks great now it's really really um, really looking smart but the, the the venues and that down in Bermondsey they're just they're not suited for the kind of table service setup it's so limited in terms of how many people we can get in as opposed to what we are used to getting in and handling and kind of what we need to um, I, I feel like it's probably the biggest challenge that we've faced over the last few months is is how to how to get Bermondsey to where it, where it needs to be um, I think it's probably a similar story for, for the other guys part of being a mixed use space is that you're you're, you're producing there during the week so the space that you make to accommodate people is very temporary um, and you really rely on that kind of standing up vertical drinking trade which has obviously completely gone and, and who knows when that will be back so our capacity is you know massively massively affected by that yeah I feel it's a real shame because it's the final part of, of what we said we'd do in our, our crowdfunding was to, to, to renovate the site and um, refurbish it and, and turn it into what we've we've called it now the arch house so it's this playing on farmhouse that's our are going to be the brand for the mixed fermentation and and we're looking to do a launch of the first beers of that in november but how do you do a launch in a a, a site where you uh, by 
by current standards, it either might be closed or it's going to be yeah. one household at a, uh, at a time. Um, so I, I'm, I just can't wait for us to almost wake up from this because I think when we get back to normal, yeah. it's going to be a really a real showstopper of a site. It'll have the freshest beers from here produced, but then excellent mixed fermentation, uh, really nice setting, and, and you know I hope the other venues and, um, and breweries along... Um, the Bermondsey Mile managed to get through this because it it become a, a world hub and yeah you know there's no doubt I think for us ourselves down 45 percent there you know that's that's hard it's really really hard yeah. when actually with the with the refurb and the more space you know that's about what we would we would hope it was going to grow by right you know or yes so it's a complete opposite so. direction yeah. um, <laughs> but you know I think at least to some degree we've taken the right course because we knew. Um, with things being quiet, especially over lockdown, it was the right time to to do some refurbishment. I mean, mm. time time will tell if it uh, if it. Uh, I, I, I'm confident, but we just need to manage ourselves well until we get through to the the end of this and and the new world that will exist after it. Absolutely, and and Croydon. Tell me about Croydon. About here, this opened just before lockdown, yeah. was it? Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, we were obviously looking primarily for for a uh, an industrial unit. You know, the arch has been served us really well, but they're not the most si- sort of uh, uh, best fitting for for uh, beer production. You know, they're all, they're fine, but we wanted just a big square unit to keep things nice and simple. And essentially, what we got. It took us a little while to find it. Um, we had a couple of well, one other one that we were sort of going for, but didn't didn't work out in the end. Um, so it took a little bit longer, but it's been really good. Um, the site works, the space works really nicely for the for the beer, for the brewery, um, and we've got um, you know a sort of embryonic tap room here, which uh, we were hoping to do a lot more with, and, and we and we will. Um, it's still running on Saturdays at the moment, and actually when we when we opened that, we did a couple of of little event days. Um, we were really surprised actually with the the um, reception from kind of lo- from locals we didn't really think it was well we didn't really know um, what it was going to be like you know you're used to Bermondsey where you've just got so much footfall um, whereas here we're a little bit out of the way but um, I think there's a lot of a lot of thirsty people around and a lot of beer drinkers um, yeah. and it's yeah it's we're, we're next to Signal Brewery as well who um, just, just got their tap room up and running as well so the yeah. plan is to, to the, new, the new Croydon beer crawl yeah 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 <laughs> um, we wanted because we've got the space in a bit more outside space. We, we were going to look at doing some sort of mini festivals as well, um, which again we will do when we can. Um, so there's good potential for that. Um, I, I, to, I sort of feel like if we, because we were looking at spaces much closer to Bermondsey as well, and if we opened another brewery and tap room in sort of around Bermondsey area, you know, no one would have cared really. Like you, well, you've already got that; it's not really news, but coming out here it's kind of a new area for us so um reaching a, a new market some new people and yeah, it's been been really good yeah i completely agree bit of a commute but it's all right <laughs> I care on your well absolutely yeah 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 <laughs> Hawks recently wrote this article in Pellicle, didn't he, yes. about you, which was which is a beautiful article, really good. But um, he, the, the quote that got sort of banded around social media was that you were the most underrated brewery in London. Yeah. Um, and I suppose, I, I suppose from a personal point of view, I thought, really, you know, I've I've always thought they're the best on the mile, and um, but I wonder where that's, that's come kind. from. That that um, that kind of I say it to everybody on the mile. No, yeah. no, no. <laughs> don't well, actually. <laughs> But so I, I wonder where that's come from, that sort of most underrated. I, I think it goes back to the fact that we were in bottles for a very long time and we were quite a small brewery. So so whilst anyone who'd come and visited us in Bermondsey might have had our best and really enjoyed it, you just didn't see it around as much. Mm. And suddenly with the, um, the launch of the cans and especially the circumstances where we've been having such great trades with the web shop and really embracing um, 
well being embraced on social media I think it's created a sort of resurgence of, of recognition so that the team all really happy because they feel like they're getting some of the, the credit yeah. they, they deserve <laughs> but for those who really know us Emma it's it's maybe a bit of a surprise I, I um, think the, the you, choice you'd of, hear that. of styles we do as well you know we we didn't go down the New England IPA path or the um, pastry stout or Alka stouts no stouter pops that's what I want to call them now um, we didn't do that so those were the beers that I suppose as, as the prevalence of cans was really coming up um, bottles dwindling um, and those kind of beer styles really taking off they, they, you know, that's what was flooding the internet and the kind of the hype thing we just didn't it just it never felt right for us to en engage with it really um, there are some breweries that make those beer styles that's their thing that's their like MO and it and it works and they're you know they put a lot into them and they and they're kind of mastering them but it, it doesn't feel right when you you see a brewery that you know that's not really kind of what they're about and then they kind of try and chase it or whatever and we, we never really wanted to do that there are a lot of beer styles out there that we loved and we wanted to champion and I think for, for that sort of period of time, they just weren't the beers that were going to be getting the hype and the attention on the internet. That's still the case to a certain extent, but there definitely seems to be a broader appreciation for classic styles as well now. It really, it's kind of, I feel maybe the last year, maybe 18 months, has, has kind of reminded people that there are all these other fantastic styles out there. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of where that. we've always kind of I sat. Think the, I think the market's come back towards that, yeah. that uh, sort of area, particularly on the... It, there, there is a trendy side to craft beer and you know there, I guess that's it is identifying when things are just a, f a fad and when they're a trend and and if you're um, you know if you stick with what you're doing it, it is really really nice to see articles like that come out which mm. uh, you know effectively um, give some appreciation to all of that that hard work and and it, you know if, if that means we we suddenly have to become popular <laughs> well I'll take it for the, for the <laughs> <laughs> Um, <coughs> finally, just going back to the, the, the situation, um, I can't think of anything else to call it really. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, I read a blog post of yours when when the first lockdown came in. You were up in Liverpool, bless them, uh, with Neptune mm. Brewery, um, and you kind of. I don't know which one of you writes the blog, but uh, but I think that was actually Ed, our sales guy. Okay, yeah, well, um, in, but we know Les yeah. and, and the team. Yeah. Well. And in that blog, there was sort of this, uh, you know, this acknowledgement that this this crisis could be spell the end of a number of small brewers, mm. um, but also this kind of uh, this optimism, you know, well, let's just tr there's nothing else we can do. Let's just yeah. try and get through it, you know, and that kind of spirit of yeah. the beer industry. I don't know if you want to say a bit more about that. Well, I mean, I imagine <laughs> that spirit's getting a little tired now, <laughs> um, <laughs> but. Uh, you know, I can't speak for Neptune. I, I had a good chat with Les, and I know that those guys, you know, everyone, everyone did rally around, and they were um, selling direct at their tap room, and um, we we really felt for them. Later on, you know, once that brew was ready, it was middle of lockdown, and we said, "Can we get some?" And they couldn't get theirs canned because there were no um, slots with the with the mobile canners, um, because obviously everyone was trying to, and it again made us realise how fortunate we were um, to be in our position, but just to feel really sorry for those breweries, particularly with a, a, a draft model or mm. reliant on, on cans. I mean, I think, I think the thing is to be a small brewer is probably to be quite, um, quite open-minded and entrepreneurial in your thinking. And um, I guess that's what will get Neptune through and what will get us through is that it's ultimately just a problem to be solved. Yeah. And, you know, whilst, uh, yeah, we may be a little less enthusiastic of... Uh, you know we'll, we'll get through it no matter what i think it, it it's it's still probably the case that yeah you know, we'll just mumble about it now or, or grumble about yeah. it i mean ult ultimately you know we didn't you, you know you don't really have a choice right you kind of you have to find a way um you know the, the brewery supports um obviously myself and jack and all the rest of our employees you know we needed we needed to find a way to make it work because we all have 
you know, rent and mortgages to pay and we need to eat and everything <laughs> like that, as everyone does. So we were, yeah, very fortunate that we had the tools to enable us to, to, to adapt and change. Um, and, you know, we kind of we kind of owe it to we owe it to the team, really, given that we do have the tools to, to, to get our heads down and, and find that way through. And, Keep, uh, and to our shareholders. Uh, yeah, know, of course. Yeah. 500 people put their faith in us. Yeah. In 2000 and well, beginning of 2019 is when it completed. And um, I know we've had a f we've had actually some tremendous support from them. I think a couple had kind of uh, written us off and uh, <laughs> said, you know, I, I can't tell you how impressed I am and how you've come round from this. And I guess that's it. It's really hard to communicate because it's a real hard balance between there's ultimately reality of a, a finite amount of money at the end of the day. If things stay really difficult for everyone for too long, yeah. sooner or later you will go bust. But I think if we can keep showing the resilience we have, um, we'll get through it. And then on the other side of it, you know, we'll be all that much stronger and and uh, crack on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>